great. I think we can get started. Hello, everyone. In person, and hello, everyone at Zoom. Thank you for being here again. The Kent Seminar Series today, we have Professor Jaime Hernandez. He's an assistant professor at Marquette University since 2019. And his research interests include modeling, flexible and rigid payment structures, entire payment interaction, and payment evaluation. He holds a bachelor's in civil engineering from the National University of Colombia at Medellin and a master's from Ohio University. And he is a proud doctorate uh, graduate and alumni from the University of Illinois at the Bernard Champaign, the Department of Civil Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering. In uh, 2015, he graduated and he was in this group. Some of us still remember working with him here in the room. And I kept my introduction short because I know Professor Lakani would like to say a few things because he was also his uh, student when he was here. So I think I think we need time enough to hear what I'm gonna say, but uh, <laughs> uh, there's a few things about the excuse me, Jaime, that I should uh, share with you that uh, uh, working with him was always a pleasure. That's one. Uh, he finished his PhD, and of course, he stayed with us for a couple of years as uh, as a postdoc. He's very smart. He really helped us quite a bit in the new development for the finite element that many of you have been using so far. So he really add a lot to that information. And currently, we're very happy that we are working with him on another project. Uh, Jaime, we always miss you here. And <laughs> I can tell you, the people who didn't work with Jaime, they don't know what they are missing. So that's to put it in a simple way. It's joy to work with such smart people but at the same time, always have the right attitude about the work that they are doing. So, Jaime, we're glad that you are with us here. Uh, thank you, Professor, and thank you, Javi. Uh, it's very, very, uh, I feel honored to be invited to the Ken Seminar Series with the alumni of the, of the center. I am aware of the caliber of uh, the people who graduate from, from the group, and, and, and I feel very honored that I'm a part of the, of the roster for this semester. Um, with that being said, I would like to start by also acknowledging uh, Gabby, Gab uh, Gabriela Lucanos. She is uh, a master's student under my supervision, and she allowed me to present her work. She has done most of the things that I will uh, discuss. And I, I, I wanted to say that she has done an extremely amazing job. She is a master's student in what we call the accelerated degree program. It's the program where you stay one extra year after your a bachelor's degree, your undergrad, and then you can get a master's degree. And in that time frame, she, she will be able to complete her thesis this summer, which again is most of the results that I will present in this presentation. So the title of my presentation is uh, Frequency Dependent Type Properties and Their Effect on Energy Consumption and Dynamic Loading. Uh, this idea resulted from uh, the project, uh, the projects that I was involved uh, when I was a member of ICT. And then I kept thinking, what about the, 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 the fact that the, the tire is made out of rubber and rubber is a viscoelastic material and the models that are used to estimate fuel consumption and dynamic loading, they all assume that the stiffness of the tire doesn't depend on the frequency. So that's where the curiosity stem from. And then um, when I started here at Marquette University, I um, was able to work with Dave Newman and Gavi, Gavi uh, was the one who performed the testing and then I will detail that, that work. So first of all, I would like to start with a few statements about transportation. So the first one is safety. Uh, according to the NHTSA, uh, almost 10% of fatal crash crashes in the US occur on wet pavement. And according to FHWA, 70% of those could be prevented only by improving the surface friction on the pavement. Also tire wear, Americans uh, spend almost 20 billion per year replacing tires in passengers and, car, uh, and passenger cars and light trucks. This uh, doesn't account by the money that is spent on the, uh, by the truck tires, but also tire wear is another factor that is influenced by the payment. And on top of that, we have the amount of money that the federal, the state and local governments spend on transportation. So in this pie chart that we have here, 
we have the different modes of transportation and we can see how um, almost uh, 177 billion of dollars in 2017 were spent on highways and this uh, granted includes operation and maintenance but most of this money is spent on maintenance and we also have energy consumption if we look at the numbers from 2021 20, uh, according to AI um, 32 percent was spent by industrial sector but 25 uh, 27 percent the second of uh, these uh, numbers was spent on transportation and then again pavement is a very important factor here and finally, we have emissions. Um, according to um, AEA in 2021, 20, uh, 37% of the CO2 emissions were uh, the product of transportation activities. So if we look at all these statistics and all these numbers, they do uh, have one thing in common and is the tire payment interaction. And that's where I would like to start um, the second portion of my presentation. So why is this so important? So I will focus mostly on two things. The first one is the energy consumption. So when the tire is rolling on the road surface, uh, there is a resistance produced by the pavement against this movement, and this is called rolling resistance. If we want to be technical, the rolling resistance is just the energy dissipated per unit distance travel. So we do know there are um, three components in the estimation of the rolling resistance, and one of them is that rolling resistance that is generated by the roughness of the pavement. So we do know the, rough, the rougher the uh, road, the more energy and the more fuel will be consumed. Then we have the pavement damage. So not only a rougher pavement will produce uh, greater energy consumption, but also that excitation that is created by the pavement roughness will create some dynamics in the vehicle that will exacerbate the magnitude of the load that the axle is applied on the pavement. So we do consider in our design uh, that let's say uh, we're designing, uh, let's say one is also 18 kips, but then the actual load that the uh, axle is applying to the pavement changes as a function of this uh, roughness because of those dynamic effects. And then in the push or in the um, intention of moving towards uh, mechanistic approaches, there has been uh, models has been proposed that look into uh, these two factors. Those are vehicle models. The main purpose is to merge this uh, estimation of energy consumption and also the um, quantification of the dynamic load so we can translate those dynamic loads into contact stresses that can be used to predict um, the pavement damage. However, uh, these vehicle dynamic models, they uh, assume that the uh, tire properties, they, knew, they do not depend on frequency. Um, to be more specific, they assume that one value uh, for the tire stiffness and one uh, value for the damping. And I will elaborate on these models later on. But we do know that uh, the tire is mostly made out of rubber. And rubber is a viscoelastic material, meaning that the stiffness properties, uh, they depend on both the uh, excitation frequency and the temperature. So this uh, testing and this work that I will present focuses on the effect of that loading frequency. But um, the idea is to extend this work later on to include the effect of the temperature mostly using uh, numerical models. So what is the objective? The objective is, the main objective is to use laboratory testing to determine the frequency dependent properties of two truck tires, and then use those frequency dependent uh, properties into a quarter car model to estimate the energy dissipation and the dynamic loading. Uh, granted, this portion of the presentation will focus on preliminary results, but it um, helps us to understand how significant the effect of these frequency dependent properties of the tire are. So let's start with the tires. Uh, these two tires, we have a wide base tire and a dual tire assembly. So these two tires were used um, but uh, to study the effect of, or to compare the effect of wide base tires on pavement damage in this, um, in a research performed at ICT, um, where uh, the project that I was involved in, the supervision of Professor Arcadi and some other students, Angeli, Mustafa, uh, Songu. 
And then the main objective was to compare what the pavement damage between these two tires uh, is. So now I took these same two tires, I brought them to market, and uh, that's, those are the two tires that uh, were used in the laboratory testing. So these tires, we did not pick them as part of the white based study, just uh, our will. So a, a group of um, almost 10 DOTs and the Rubber Manufacturers Association, they got together and they agreed that these would be the tires that can represent both a typical white based tire and a typical dual tire assembly. And then we have the loading frame. So if we can see in this picture here, the tire was attached first to this frame right here. And at the same time, this was attached to a loading frame to an, an actuator that was used to apply the load. So this is like here, what it shows is the detail of that loading frame, the first loading frame. So first we have uh, the loading frame with uh, through holes. These two holes were used to uh, pass through uh, a couple of elements that help to stabilize the um, tire during testing. Then we have these uh, U-bolt lo uh, locations here. So the tire is not here in this picture, but this is the location of the tire. And these two uh, bolts where the axle of the tire was attached to this other frame. And then up here, we have the spherical seated clevis. So here, clevis. So here in this uh, portion is where the loading frame is attached which can be observed uh, here in this picture. So what we have here is first is the H frame. So the H frame is composed by uh, the, the two columns and the beams that we see here. Then we also have the a strong floor and we have the W1272 columns and the Ws also 1272 uh, Y flange beam. So this is the loading frame uh, sorry, the actuator is a 250 actuator, which is connected to uh, the hydraulic system uh, in the basement of our lab. This, la um, this picture is taken uh, in our structure like the EMSTL. Uh, this is uh, where we perform all the structural testing in, in our department. So then after that, what we decided to do is we subjected these two tires to uh, this testing metrics. So first we have the tire type, we have two tires, the white base tire and the dual tire assembly that I introduced in the previous slide. Uh, then we have uh, three inflation pressures, uh, 552, 690 and 827 kilopascals. These translate to 100 PSI, 100 PSI that's uh, 690, uh, 552 is 80 PSI and then 120 PSI. So the idea here is to represent an underinflated and overinflated tire, and then the regular tire pressure for a truck tire. Then we also have five values of um, a load. So that goes from 27 all the way to 44 kilonewtons. Then we have uh, three amplitudes. I will explain in the, um, in the following slide what this amplitude refers to, but it's the main objective here is to represent different degrees on, of um, unevenness that we see on the pavement surface. So of course, a pavement that I will have an unevenness of 5.8, I will be rougher than a pavement that has an unevenness of uh, 1.27. And again, I will provide more details in the following slide about the importance of this element, of this uh, variable. And then finally, we have the frequency. So the frequency of how that uh, load is applied change from 0.1 uh, hertz to 2.5 hertz. And this is the slide that I was referring to. What we see here is the way the load was applied during testing. So first, uh, this plot what is showing is the displacement as a function of time, or as a function of time. So in this very first portion, what we're doing is we have a load control portion uh, in which, oh, sorry, I'm uh, omitting the first step, which is first we have um, what we consider the setting load. So that is a, a load of, a uh, very low magnitude that is applied just to establish the contact between the tire and uh, the, the strong floor. After that, we applied a, a force control load at the rate of 8.9 kilonewtons per, mi uh, per minute. So that represents this portion of the curve. So here we made sure that the load was applied slow enough not to activate the uh, viscoelastic response of, of the tire, but also we tried to optimize that so we didn't uh, have to wait too much time to get uh, to this point. 
Um, in order to do this, what we did is initially we applied loads very slow, a very at a very uh, low uh, loading rate, and then we found that this will uh, gave us the balance between uh, having that slow load application, but at the same time for the testing not to take too long. When we get to this point, uh, we switch to displacement control. So in this point, we hold that load for 120 seconds, and the idea here is again to get rid of any um, deformation that it's uh, withstand by the tire, again, because of uh, the viscoelastic nature. And once you get to this point is when you to, uh, apply the sine wave. And each of these portions that we see in the figure is that sine wave application as a different values of frequency. So each one of these is the values of frequency that I was referring to in the previous slide. And the amplitude is just the amplitude that of the displacement that is being applied on the tire. So that is the value that changed from, if we go back to the slide here, from 5.8 to 1.27. So the amplitude here, in this case, we can see that it's, uh, this portion is uh, around five millimeters. So the whole uh, range is uh, almost 10 millimeters. And then, so we apply, uh, we keep the constant load, we apply the sine a wave, then, we load again at this very same displacement. We keep the load uh, constant or the displacement constant for 120 uh, seconds. We apply it again and we repeat for the four uh, frequencies. Uh, this, what I'm showing is just a detail of that uh, sine wave. Again, if we do that same zoom, zoom for any of the other portions, we will see that we have that uh, very same uh, sine variation. And after that, uh, we, repeat for each frequency, and then we perform the unloading of the curve. Now, I wanna mention one important detail here that since this portion, the very first portion in the loading of the tires, uh, is load control. We can use this because the, the data acquisition, acquisition system is recording the force. I can use this portion to calculate the static, uh, static stiffness because I will have the load, I will have the displacement, and then I can use the slope of that curve to calculate the static stiffness, that stiffness that is commonly used in the uh, conventional vehicle dynamic models. So now here in this uh, slide, what we're showing is just um, that load has been applied at different um, uh, frequencies. So on the left, we have uh, the high frequency and on the right, we have the low frequency. So we can see how the tire is deforming as I'm applying uh, these sinusoidal loads. And then the idea again is to record the, the reaction. So in this case, the force that is being generated as um, we are applying this sinusoidal load. Now, what do we do with this? So we have a tire that uh, it's contacting the strong floor that is being simulated by this um, surface here. But then in order to include those frequency dependent properties, instead of assuming that I can represent the tire only by a single spring, which is what the conventional quarter car model does, for example, I will include these other two elements connected in parallel to this static spring. So those two are a stiffness and a damping. And the main characteristic of these two is that the value of that constant, it depends on the excitation frequency. And we will see how uh, that plays in the experimental results. So based on this, I can come uh, analyzing this model, this representation of the tire, I can see how the force that is being generated as a response to the displacement control um, action on the tire, that is the product of this damping that depends on the frequency times the uh, tire's velocity, the velocity meaning in the vertical direction as I'm applying the load, then the uh, dynamic stiffness multiplied by the difference between that, this, the tire displacement main, minus the initial displacement. So when I finish that linear portion in the load control um, uh, part of the testing, that value will be the delta when I finish. And then this multiplied the dynamic stiffness. And then this other value is the static stiffness multiplied by the displacement of the tire. So if I look at this equation, the, I do know what the velocity and the displacement are. And also I know that um, initial displacement because that I control it during the testing. 
And I also know what the force, because that is the reaction to that um, displacement control action on the tire. So knowing, knowing the force and the and these displacements, I can do a regression analysis, and then I can back calculate what those properties are. For, so for every frequency, for every load, and for every tight inflation pressure, and for every amplitude, I'm able to do this regression, and I can determine what the values of those constants are. Now, from this point on, what I will show is uh, a summary of the experimental results that we got. So first, with the static stiffness, the good thing about the static stiffness is that we can compare that with the testing that has been done on these tires. So as part of that, um, that research that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, presentation that compared the damage of white based tires with dual assembly, those tires were tested to determine not only contact stresses, but also contact area and the low deflection curve. That low deflection curve we used, uh, I used and uh, another uh, colleagues in ICT have used in their dissertations to validate our tire models. So in this case, I'm doing the comparison between those values and the values that we obtain from our testing. Um, and the second comparison is between the, the value that I obtained from the regression and from the linear, linear portion. I will detail that in a little bit. But let's start with the static stiffness. So for the static stiffness, the first thing that we notice is that the KS increased with the tire inflation pressure. This is not a new result. Basically, every research that has been done on low deflection, low deflection curves of tires has shown that as you increase the tire inflation pressure, the stiffness, the vertical stiffness of the tire also increases. And this is uh, because of the way that the tire works as a structure. So the, the tire is a, a toroid element that is made out of rubber, but the stiffness and the geometry of the tire is fixated or is provided by that tire inflation pressure. So this was uh, also, uh, we were expected, expecting to see this. And then also something that is uh, fairly obvious, I would say, is that that static frequency, that KS does not depend, that static stiffness, sorry, that static stiffness does not depend on the value of the frequency. And that we can see how, we can see that uh, in this slide very clearly. So here we have in the vertical axis, the value of that static stiffness on the, on, on the vertical axis, on the horizontal axis, we have the value of the frequency in radians per second. And then this group of lines here are uh, corresponding for, to the wide base tires and these two on top to the dual tire assembly. And we see that the lines are, are pretty much horizontal, meaning that the frequency doesn't have any effect on the value of the static stiffness. Then we also compare this static stiffness with two sources. The first one is with those results from a CSIR. So in our study, we obtained that that static stiffness is 1,062 and almost 2,000 kilonewtons per meter. And then when we look at the report and we obtain the value of the stiffness as the slope of that low deflection curve, we see that the values are very close with uh, being closer for the dual, 5.3% uh, difference. And then uh, for the wide is 11.5 uh, difference, which is acceptable considering that uh, this is uh, experimental test. And then we were also able to compare our, the value that we obtain, our static stiffness from two sources. The first source is that initial portion of the loading history, the portion that is load control when I'm applying uh, the load and measuring the deflection. So that slope will give me a static stiffness. But I also can compare with the value that I obtain from this model, because this KS, I, do, I assume that I don't know it when I'm doing the, the back calculation from this equation in the, sinusoid, in the portion that is applying the sinusoidal load. And we see here that those results are also uh, very close to each other. So here we have the two tires, the white base tire and the dual tire assembly. We have the three inflation pressures. And then we have the two values of the stiffness here. This column is the value that we obtain uh, from the slope of the load deflection curve. And this is the result of the optimization. And we can see here that the difference, the highest difference is 8.4 uh, for the lowest frequency. This is probably because at that low frequency, you start seeing the effect of the nonlinearity maybe of um, or, or the effect of large deformations in the rubber in the tire. But in general, we see that the agreement is uh, very satisfactory. 
Now, moving on to the dynamic stiffness. We see here the typical variation of how that dynamic stiffness uh, change with the frequency. So here in the vertical axis, we have that uh, dynamic stiffness. On the horizontal axis, we have the frequency, again, in radians per second. And each of these lines represent the variation with respect to the frequency for different values of that amplitude. The, that means the amplitude of that sine wave that I'm applying. And we can see, again, this is re just a representative, but in general, we saw that uh, that dynamic stiffness can change up to 40% with the frequency. In general, it increases with the frequency uh, um, up until you get to a value of um, the fair value of the frequencies, but also it decreases with amplitude. So here we see that the blue line, which has an amplitude of 1.27, has more frequency than the green line, which has a larger amplitude. We also notice that KD increases approximately 20% when you change the load from 26.7 to 44.5 kilonewtons. And then finally, another, as, another important aspect is that we were able to take these variations for all our uh, test matrix and we're able to apply this regression. The importance of this regression is that in order for me to perform the modeling, it's very important for me to have a mathematical expression that can represent the variation of that dynamic fre frequency as a function of uh, fr a frequency. So in this case, we do know omega, that is the angular frequency that I'm applying. And then I did the regression and I was able to obtain C1K, C2K, 3K, and 4K. Those in this case will come the regression parameters. And in all the cases, the, um, the, the regression fit was um, excellent. Now, moving on to the damping, same arrangement of the plot, vertical axis is the uh, damping as a function of frequency, the horizontal axis is the frequency, and each of these lines represent a, a different value of the amplitude of that sine wave that I'm applying. So the first and the most obvious one is that that frequency, as you increase the frequency, the value of the uh, damping decreases, and most of that uh, decrement happened between the first uh, two uh, frequencies. Um, it increased with load. Uh, granted, that increment was not very significant, was uh, between 4 and 10 percent. And also, it decreased this uh, portion. It, it could be as high as uh, 60 percent. And then also, we saw lower values of this dynamic damping for the dual tire assembly compared to the white. And also in this case, we were able to fit another equation. So in this case, the fit is just a power function. So here, uh, omega is our angular frequency. And we did perform the regressions again to, to obtain a mathematical expression that I can use in that uh, vehicle dynamic model in order to take into consideration uh, the effect of the frequency on the uh, tire properties. Now, this concludes the experimental portion of the presentation. Now let's move on to uh, the, mm, the modeling of uh, the vehicle. And in that, I will focus uh, on the quarter car model. Granted, this is not the best vehicle dynamic model that is out there. And actually there is, uh, I'm aware there is a line of research in, in ICT where the, um, these models have been extended even to include the effect of the, of the full track, a, a class uh, eight vehicle. But we just wanted to use the core car model just as a starting point to see if the effect is actually uh, significant. And this is the, the, just the question. I'm not going to elaborate uh, on this, but um, this is just a conventional core car model. We have two masses. One is the sprung and one is the unsprung mass. The two masses are connected by spring and a dashboard. And then here in this model, the tire is represented just as one spring, meaning. The, that one static stiffness that has been used um, conventionally in these models. And this is just a matrix representation of the two differential equations that you get. So this is a two a degree of freedom system, the two degrees of freedom being the vertical displacement of each of the masses, which are represented here by X, S, and X, U. Now, what will happen if I do include those extra two parameters that I mentioned earlier? So now instead of having one single spring that doesn't depend on the frequency, I will add a dynamic spring 
or a spring whose properties depend on the frequency and also a dashboard whose stiffness de uh, depend on the frequency. And keep in mind here that this is exactly what we did in our testing. Our testing provided to us these values and these values, we do have the mathematical expression that will give me the corresponding property at each value of frequency. So in that case, the uh, system of differential equations changes where you have uh, these red symbols. So here in this point, I would add the dynamic um, damping. Here I'll have the dynamic stiffness and here I will have also the dynamic uh, damping and dynamic stiffness. I, I forgot to mention that this Y represents the, uh, the movement of the, that is the excitation at the base, okay? Uh, and that is important because when we find the frequency response functions, this Y will be a sinusoidal function. But if we want to consider the roughness, this will be represented by a, a spectral density function that can represent the roughness of the rope. So now we saw the differential equation, we put this into a Python code. And then the first thing that we did is make sure that that code was proper that was appropriate and there were no uh, bugs in the, in, the, in the code. So first we started um, by levels. So the first thing that we did is we compared with the typical frequency response function of the conventional uh, quarter car model. So in that case, the only thing that I will need to do in my code is to switch the value of KD and CD at to zero. And then we compare uh, with the values in the literature. Again, the frequency response function that I care about is this H of Z. This is nothing more than the difference in the displacement between the two uh, masses, because that is what will determine the magnitude of dynamic load and also the amount of energy dissipation that is happening in the, in the vehicle. And then I went ahead and compared with um, the solutions reported in the literature. So in this case, we're taking uh, the solution presented in uh, Jazar. This is a, a text of uh, vehicle dynamics. Here, the vertical axis, we have that frequency response function of the difference of the vertical displacement of the masses. This parameter R is just uh, a normalization of the excitation frequency. And each color represents a different value of the damping. The damping provided by the uh, connection between the two uh, masses. So the values that we obtain from uh, Jazar are the dots and the continuous lines are the values provided by our code. And we can see that the match is um, virtually perfect. Then we went ahead and made the problem a little bit harder. So now let's not have a base excitation that is a sinusoidal excitation, but it's just a roughness of a pavement. So in that case, we rely on the solution presented by Luhelam in the Journal of Engineering Mechanics in 2015. What he did, does present is the normalization of this parameter pi. Pi is just a, a dimensionless parameter that um, indicates the energy dissipation in the quarter car model, normalized with respect to the same value that you get from the golden car model. The plot on the left is for gamma of 0.2. Gamma is simply a parameter that is the ratio between the two masses, and the beta is just the ratio of the frequencies, the natural frequencies of the two masses. Uh, here on the right, we have just a fixed value of beta for different values of gamma. And again, we see that our, um, our code is able to capture that solution. Again, in this case, what we change is the excitation at the base is not a sinusoidal function anymore, but it is a, a random um, a spectral uh, spectral density function representing the road, but still the parameters of CD and KD were uh, maintained as zero. Now in this one, we went one step further, which actually is very close to the one I presented before and is the change in roughness induced uh, fuel consumption. In this case, we have um, the, the values reported by Luhelam in 2015 are the dots, and then the continuous function is what we obtain from our solution. Now here we see that uh, there is some uh, difference. And then actually that's a point that I wanted to highlight because when in that study, they back calculate the tire stiffness. So they back calculate a parameter from which 
you are supposed to calculate the, the tire stiffness. And those values are significantly higher than the ones that are reported in the experimental test. That is one thing. The other thing is uh, there's no clarity, clarity in the value of chi that is used. So uh, we were able to see that um, based on other reference from the same authors that there was a value that it was uh, not very significant. So uh, that also might be the cause of this small difference at the low values of IRI. Now, moving on to what the effect of, the, of that is on the uh, fuel consumption and dynamic load. Granted, from this point on, these are preliminary results. We'll still fine tuning and analyzing this, but still what we have right now um, shed some light in what we would expect uh, as a final result. So first, uh, in this case, the road roughness model that I use that we use is this one right here. So in this case, this SU is just the power spectral density of the road profile. And this constant right here is what defines the level of roughness. So that changes from very good all the way to, uh, to very poor. This uh, value right here of SU of uh, kappa naught. This N1, N2, and K0, those are model parameters that are provided by uh, Sibon. This is again taken from Sibon. Uh, his uh, type M interaction book from 1999. And then we also calculate the dynamic loading coefficient. The dynamic loading coefficient is given by this expression. Um, so here P0 is that static load. So the, the load that uh, it's being applied when the, the, when the vehicle is not moving. And then this SF is given by this matrix multiplication here. But what I wanted to highlight is that this HZ is that frequency response function, function that you obtain when you assume that the base excitation is a sinusoidal load. And then this SU is just the road representation, okay? There is some change in variable here, but that uh, can be taken care of. Another important thing here is that this integral goes to zero from zero to infinity. And that is giving us right now a little bit of headache because, um, that when you have to perform this integration up to infinity, there has some numerical challenges regarding the values of the stiffness when the frequency is very high, regarding the, the convergence of this integral. But we have been able to, uh, up to an extent, to be able to take care of this uh, numerical. So the first thing is, what is the effect on the dynamic loading coefficient? So what we did here, what we have here is on the vertical axis of each of these three plots is the dynamic loading coefficient. On the horizontal axis, we have the speed, and the blue line represents the value for the dual tire assembly, and the uh, orange line is the value for the wide base tire. Each of these plots represent a different value of roughness that basically corresponds to the first, third, and fifth column in the table from the previous slide. And we can see here first that the difference between the two tires increase as you increase the speed, but also that the difference uh, moves to 17%. And I say moves to 17% because there are some studies that have looked into this, what the difference between the dynamic loading coefficient between the two tires are, but without including these frequency dependent properties. And those studies report that the difference is sometimes as low as 5%, sometimes is as high as 8%. But we're seeing here that if you do include the effect of the frequency on the stiffness properties, that difference goes up to 17%. Another interesting thing that we are analyzing right now is that that difference is almost constant as you increase the roughness. So granted, of course, the value of the dynamic load coefficient is larger as you increase the roughness, and that is expected. Um, but we see that that difference is uh, almost constant. And that is the reason why I have these plots in a different scale, just because I wanted to highlight that that difference between the two, two tires is almost the same regardless of the roughness, and that value is 17%. Another thing that we were able to analyze is that when you include only the static uh, stiffness, so that KS value, you end up having that the white base had higher dynamic loading coefficient than the dual tire assembly, which we know is something that is not expected. Why? Because the dual, the the amount of walls that the dual tire has, which is two, is half the amount of walls that the dual tire assembly has, which is four. And if you look at the geometry of the tire, 
which actually were able to analyze um, as part of uh, my PhD work, the geometry of the, of the walls of the tire and the material properties of the tire are almost the same for both tires. So the difference is basically the amount of walls that you have. And we also know that that vertical stiffness is mostly controlled by that wall of the tire. So if you ignore the damping, even if it's constant with the stiffness, a constant with the frequency, and if you ignore the frequency dependent, dependent properties, you will end up running into this unusual result. Now, regarding the energy dissipation, again, these are preliminary results. In this case, we took the parameters for um, an articulated track according to Siboni in 1999. We worked with the dimensionless energy dissipation, how it was defined by Lam in 2015. And what we did find there is that the difference is significant. So here in the horizontal axis, we have the waviness number, if you will, that is a representation, a representation of how rough the road is. The vertical axis is that a dimensionless energy, energy dissipation that uh, among other things takes care of, for example, the effect of uh, speed. And then we see that, that static, the, the energy dissipation when you only include the static stiffness is significantly larger than when you include the dynamic parameters. And the explanation that, that we are still uh, analyzing and considering is that when you have the static, you don't have that motion of the tire that allows you to reduce that um, difference in speed between the two masses. So that's why you end up having an energy dissipation that is significantly lower than the, when you assume that the tire is only represented by a static spring. Again, these are prelimin preliminary results and we'll have uh, more insights as we analyze uh, more data. And that leads to uh, the final remarks of the presentation. So first is that the, the laboratory testing does show that the stiffness properties of the tires, they do depend on the excitation frequency. So in our lab testing, we consider that a sine waves with different frequency. But in real life, that would be just a road having different degrees of roughness. And also that the quarter car model can be updated to include these uh, frequency dependent properties. And the, the preliminary results show that first, the dynamic load coefficient for the dual tire assembly is 17% higher than for a uh, wide base tire. And that the roughness induced energy dissipation from the quarter car model is significantly lower if dynamic tire properties are included. With that, I would like to conclude by acknowledging Dave Newman. He is the uh, director of our ESTLM here at Marquette. Uh, he has been very helpful in performing all the testing and, and guiding uh, Gavin and, and me in this process, and also to the GHR Foundation for providing the financial support. Uh, thank you. We have time for several questions. We have one in the room. We have several in the room. Um, you can go first, Angeli. Hi, man. It's great to see you, as always. I have many questions, but I'll narrow it down. Um, one, if I might have two. The first one is, um, could you elaborate again how you instrumented the tire? I wasn't quite um, uh, sure. So I understand the actuator actually moving, but I was a bit disconnected on the actual data collection as you were imposing that loading on the tire. Yes. So if we... Let me look at the right picture here. So actually the tire itself is not instrumented. So this, the, the, the actuator is connected to the frame and the frame is connected to the tire. The tire has an axle that we specifically designed and fabricated uh, for these tires. But what everything is being measured in the actuator. So you, if, if when you're applying the displacement control, you're measuring the force. When you're applying the force control, you're measuring the displacement. So again, it's not that the tire has any instrumentation itself. Everything is measured in here in the, in, the, in the actuator. I see, okay. And I understand, like, it's nice that you showed that the results matched for two different data sets with sinusoidal and roughness loading. Um, I guess that means that any behavior coming from the actuator is taken out, right? Because 
since you're taking your data from the actuator, then the tire itself, is it by luck or right? Like there's no noise associated to the actuator that somehow you're able to represent the tire when you're really just using actuator data than actually instrumenting the tire and getting responses from the tire itself. So yeah, that's that's the beauty of the frequency response function. So basically, the basic re, the frequency response function. So this this function right here. So this, if if we look at the theoretical development, the frequency, the fact that I'm applying in the lab a sinusoidal load and the fact that the tire is actually seeing a random vibration in the field, that is taken care of by the frequency response function. So the frequency response function is just a method that allows you that once you know the frequency response function, which basically is how the tire responds to a sinusoidal excitation, you can build the response to any type of excitation, including the one that is random from the pavement surface. So this is a, a method from, from dynamics that is applied to, to pretty much any structure. So you can, uh, it's something similar when you analyze, for example, the impulse response. If you know the impulse response of, of a system, the dynamic response of a system to an impulse, you, based on that, you, and using superposition and some more elaborated approaches, you can build the response of that system to any excitation. And that is what is being taken advantage of in this study, and, and this is not part of something that we developed. This is the same approach that has been used, uh, for example, by, by MIT or, or um, any study that looks at what the effect of the payment roughness is on the dynamic loading and the uh, energy consumption. Question from Johan. Um, hi, hi, Hemi. I hope you can hear me. Nice to see you and thanks for the presentation. I have two questions, although the first one is just a clarification. Uh, could you go back to the slide where you were showing us the DLC plots? The DLC, the results? Yeah. So, so here, no. It was the next one, uh, that sure. one. So you said that the difference that you found between the ETA and WMT is higher than what is reported in the literature. Uh, mm -hmm. for, a given, for a given roughness profile, but how can how can you be sure that that difference comes exclusively for the frequency dependence of the tire and not for the, from the roughness profile itself? Or are you using exactly the same roughness profile that was used in previous studies? Well, what we did, that's a very good question. So what, what we're doing here is we're considering a wide spectrum of uh, payment roughnesses. So in each of these, each of these plots, what I'm doing is I'm just analyzing for the first, the third, and the fifth. So I keep that row profile constant, whatever that is, and then I start changing the, the speed. And this is wide enough to include those values of, for example, uh, some of them have given us a function of IRI. So this very same plot, but on the horizontal axis, you have uh, IRI. And this, if we were to harmonize the values that you get from this representation of road roughness with what you get from IRI, you will see that uh, they are already including this value. And that's why we decided to go in, in that wide spectrum. So um, that's why how I, I infer that if even when I analyze all this wide spectrum of payment roughnesses, I'm finding a difference. Okay, get it. And then the second question would be that your results are showing preliminary uh, reduction in the rolling resistance. Uh, so which means that the information that the dynamic damper, dynamic uh, uh, spring and the static spring are lower than what you would see if you only consider uh, a static spring. So mm -hmm. I think it would be really useful to see what is the contribution of each of, of, each of the components that you're considering in this new tire to see where exactly the difference comes from. Because at this point, like maybe if I only use a constant spring, I will see, I don't know, a deformation of 10 millimeters. But when you consider more components, uh, the deformation of each of these components is, is considerably lower, which is causing uh, the difference in the rolling resistance, maybe. 
but the force is still the same because that is what you're controlling. And I think if we think about this, uh, you may find a benefit in measuring the rolling resistance, but in terms of the loading being applied for payment purposes, it will still be the same. That's a very good point. So the challenge that we ran into is that, so we have this, so we, our main thing is, okay, let's have this model of the load response of the tire where you have a static, a static stiffness, the dynamic stiffness, or the dynamic damping. If I were to use only the static, okay, and get rid of all the others, I can just pretty much switch off those and then see what the effect is. But for example, if you want to include the damping, what value of the damping would you use? And we've tried a few things, let's say like an average value based on the variation of the load and the, and the, the variation, sorry, the variation of that damping with the frequency, like an average being the area under the curve or the integral, and then just going from there. And we've seen that it's, it's the, even though the code can easily do that, the challenge is to include values that actually make sense, okay? Because we've seen very unusual things. For example, if you, if you look at the curves, actually we can go back. If we look at the curves for the stiffness, for example, this one right here, you see that goes up and then it slightly goes down. That means that at some point, this stiffness will become negative, which doesn't make any sense from the tire point of view, right? But then that gives you challenges from the numerical implementation, all right? So that is why, yes, from the code point of view and theoretically, it's very easy just to switch on and off each of these variables. But then the challenge is what is the value that you include in order to get results that uh, actually make sense? And that is one issue that we run into when we try to work with the values from that study that we referred to. Those values of the static stiffness, they're way too high, way too high. And then we start seeing the, that the integral was not converging and they, we get negative stiffness and all these kind of things. So it's, it's something that needs to be very, that we need to be very careful with. Thank you. Thank you so much. Although I have a last question, maybe I can. Yes. Also, okay. So can you go back to the slide where you have the equation um, showing the parameters that you need to back calculate? For the tire? That one. So mm -hmm. in this case, you say you have three parameters that you need to figure out what the values are. Mm -hmm. Are you mm -hmm. generating three equations to solve a system of three by three? Is, is that how you're solving this? Well, not really because you, you do have a lot, because if we go back, so what we did is we, oh, where am I? Just here, right? So you don't have three points, you have all this cloud of points because this is what you apply, right? And then you also measure the force. So you do have the displacement and you do have the force. So basically what you're doing is fitting a cloud of points. Right, so where the measure values are the forces that you get from the actuator and the calculated values are the ones that this equation are providing. So you do not have a system of three by three, you have a system with a cloud of points that allows you to do an optimization. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. I think we have reached the, the time allocated for the lecture. So let's all thank I may again. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you.